We're going to talk through indicator 13 today. There we go. Okay, it's going to start with if opportunity doesn't knock, build a door. This is your opportunity for all of us um, to build better IEPs for our students who are of transition age. Um, transition and building better IEPs for those age students has been a theme throughout NDE's monitoring process, or also known as the file review process for the last four or five years at least. Um, in 2020, it was the only thing they focused on within the monitoring process and found that many districts throughout the state still need to work on this. So we're doing great things with students ages 16 to 21 within ESU-8, um, as was reflected in our most recent post-school outcome survey from 2020. Our ESU-1 students who graduated in 2019 86% of the students who ended their um, time in school with a disability in ESU-8 graduated with a regular diploma. Zero dropped out in 2019. That, you can give yourselves a pat on the back. You found a way to keep them in school and finishing school. And for those of you who don't remember, the spring of 2019 was the great flood. Um, so it was, difficult to keep students engaged with all the things that were going on in their lives, but you worked with them and they completed school. 71% of those graduates had a job when they were um, contacted by UNL and the survey team last spring. That was compared to 61% of graduates with disabilities in the state. So we were doing better than the state. 46% were working um, within the community in which they were living at the time. And 68% of the ESU-8 graduates were working 30 or more hours a week compared to 54% um, as the state average. 93% of them had been enrolled in a two-year college course at some point since they had finished high school. So we have some great numbers from those surveys, but we know there are others who are still struggling and that's why we want to do things a bit differently within our piece. What are you gonna do with those or with that? <laughs> We're going to answer eight questions today. We're gonna to take a look at um, making Please sure that a transition <laughs> plan by their 16th birthday. We're going to make sure that activities are coordinated um, between what students, parents, and agencies are doing. And we're going to answer six other questions as we go through. This is all based on federal reporting for the, the state reports to the feds um, as part of IDEA compliance reporting. And so indicator 13 on that federal checklist asks the percent of youth with IEPs age 16 and above with an IEP have appropriate measurable post-secondary goals. These goals are annually updated and based upon age appropriate transition assessments, transition services. They have courses of study and they're designed to reasonably enable the student to meet the post-secondary goals. The annual IEP goals need to be related to those transition services. And so there should be evidence that the student was invited to the IEP team. So again, there are eight components and eight questions to answer. I have this in here a couple of times, but I also emailed a copy of the checklist to you this afternoon. 
so that if you wanted to take notes on that or so that you have a copy of the eight components. And it's a checklist that you can use to do your own self-monitoring within your district. I also sent a copy of the National um, Transition Assessment Center Resources Checklist. It's just a little bit more complicated than the one that I've updated for ESU-8. Okay, so let's start to work through eight things to ask yourself about your transition IEPs. First of all, do you have an appropriate measurable post-secondary goal for your students? And this goal should be written in I language. So it's as if the student is talking. Is the goal, can the goal be counted? Can we see that, yes, he, is um, attending college, living in an apartment, has a part-time job? Is the goal occurring after the student graduates? Is the post-secondary goal appropriate for the student and written with the I statement? One of the questions that you ask your students is where do you plan to work um, after you graduate from high school? You get a variety of answers to that, and it's not your place to tell them if it's right or wrong. I remember a student I had who was determined that he was going to become an archaeologist. He decided that it, when he was like eight, and when he was 12 and, and moved on from elementary to junior high, he was still determined he was going to be an archaeologist. I would love to see what that young man is doing now. Um, Maybe he met that goal. Maybe along the way through his work experiences, he achieved a different goal. But they can be very adamant. And even though you may think, oh, there's no way that student's going to become a doctor, your initial um, post-secondary goal with that student is going to be exactly what they wanted to do. And then through your transition activities, you can help shape that goal. Is the student going to attend college or does he say I learned best by watching others and so he plans to learn those skills on the job after graduation? And does the student plan to live independently? Are they going to access some adult services? How do they plan to participate in their community? And even talking about how they plan to have fun after graduation. If you plan to live at home in Oakdale, Nebraska, but you really like to go bowling, how are you going to be able to do that? Or have you thought about living in an apartment in Neely, Nebraska, Norfolk, Nebraska, someplace a little bit larger? Having those conversations with your students as you go. So here's a formula for writing a post-secondary goal. After high school, I will go to college in Norfolk and study auto mechanics. I plan to live at the dorm. That would cover all of the things that need to be included in the post-secondary goal. Or after high school, I plan to learn how to stock shelves at Walmart. I'm going to live in a supported apartment in Norfolk. That might be an example for a student who's um, in a life skills program. The goal needs to be measurable based on assessment and identify some post-secondary needs. So the assessment might be an interview process with your students. It can also be um, an assessment that takes them through a whole, exploring a whole wide range of activities and um, careers that they hadn't even thought about.
The second thing that is on the checklist and that NDE is looking for is proof that these goals are updated annually. Again, some students pick what they want to do. They are going to tell you when they're 16 and you're going to hear exactly the same career goal at 17, 18, 19, et cetera. How can you prove on your IEP that you took a look at updating that goal annually? Well, perhaps the wording changed to show that rather than going to college, he now wants to learn on the job or in an apprenticeship. Perhaps the piece about living independently changed just a bit between his goal at 16 and his goal at 17. Or it is exactly the same document in the present level of performance or the assessment section of the IEP that you reviewed the student's goal with him and the goal stays exactly the same because he still plans to go to Northeast Community College, participate in the auto body program and live in the dorm during college and in an apartment afterwards. So again, adding more detail from the assessment, changing the assessments that you use from year to year. Is there another assessment um, within your toolkit that would help the student identify whether this goal is a good match or what skills they need to learn and practice in order to obtain that um, goal in the future? Make sure that any information about transition goals begins in the IEP during which the child will turn 16. So sometimes it's easy to overlook that, oh, they're going to, we're having the IEP in September and he's turning 16 in February. Keep a close eye on that 16th birthday. So you may be talking and starting to do assessments with a 15 year old so that it's within the IEP before their 16th birthday. Question three on the checklist, is there evidence that the measurable post-secondary goals were based on an age appropriate transition assessment? In the 2019-2020 school year, all um, high schools within ESU 8 received a transition assessment binder. If you have not received that binder, please send me an email. That binder um, contained many informal assessments that you can give your students and questionnaires that you can utilize to work with the students and the parents. We also have transition assessment kits that can be checked out with some formal assessments in them. And it gives you an opportunity to look and see if the formal assessments would be a good match for your student or students before you purchase them for your district. So they're to be checked out and um, tried out, looked at by you before you would go ahead and purchase your own assessments for your district. I will let you know that I know many of you have um, the Brigance comprehensive um, inventory within your school. Some of you have the Brigance employability inventory or the Brigance transition inventory. Pieces of that can be used as your transition assessment, but you need to add, um, identify that within the assessment part of the IEP that you gave these sections of the Brigance as a transition assessment so that you can document that. You can also utilize information from formal assessments that your guidance counselor might already be given to all students within the general um, population, the general curriculum. 
as long as you're utilizing and documenting that information on the IEP, that can be a piece of your assessment there. Not everything has to be separate. The separate um, informal assessments are used to help the student really drill down into what information, what skills and training they may need in high school or even in college in order to obtain their employability and their independent living skills. So you can incorporate the transition assessment information within the IEP in a couple of different places. You could put it in the section on page two or three that says um, results of most recent district-wide and statewide assessments. As long as you identify transition assessment was given on March 21st, 2021, and here are the results. Or you could incorporate the results of those transitions assessments into the present level of performance. And again, identifying it with a heading or a statement um, that is clear to everyone on the team or the NDE reviewers that a transition assessment and or inventory was given to the child or information was gathered from the parents. Um, clearly identifying that within the present level of performance will be helpful to you too and would meet compliance. Yesterday, I participated in the SRS regional advisory meeting, and these pieces are going to be incorporated with into SRS IEPs, hopefully, before the beginning of the 21-22 school year. So we're going to rearrange the order of the IEP a bit so that the transition ass assessments, the transition goals, um, fall between present level of performance and the annual goals so that everyone is looking at transition before they look at what are we doing for the rest of the goals. Um, that, will be, that will be helpful to everyone. And again, we're hoping that's in place before 21-22 starts in August. Um, if and when it is in place, either then or at, in December, we will do further training with the actual IEP document in front of us. So it should not come as a surprise that that uh, is a change up and helps us to lead those conversations from the child's goal, sorry, the teenager's goal, um, through what all the services and goals should be on the IEP throughout that conversation and that meeting. After you have utilized the transition assessments to help identify skills and needs that the student has in order to reach his transition goal, then you as a team need to decide what transition services need to be in the IEP to reasonably enable the student to meet his or her post-secondary goal. So all of that information is leading you to answer those other questions on our current page five of the IEP. We're going to ask, are there tasks or transition support needs that need to be identified as part to help them meet the post-secondary goal? Does he need support in instruction? Does he need support through related services? through additional community experiences? Do we need to focus on the development of some employment or independent living skills that perhaps have not been incorporated prior to his 16th birthday? Are individuals and agencies that are aware of, are they aware of the task that they are responsible for? So if through the services we're talking about voc rehab be helping with the independent living piece. We need to make sure that if voc rehab isn't at the table that day, they are given that information that the IEP team assigned that task to them. So there's some more follow-up than what uh, we typically have had 
to ensure that they know within the next year or within the next semester, they need to be working through these things with the student also. Um, is there supporting to support the student or family self-advocacy with outside agencies or helping the student to become more of a self-advocate as he begins to work towards obtaining a job or advocating for himself with his parents if he wants to be living independently at some point and mom and dad have kept him cocooned? Can the student say, you know, I really do want to be able to live in Norfolk, but I don't know how to um, access public transportation. Can you help me practice using Dial-A-Ride in Stewart, Nebraska, so that when I move to O'Neill or Norfolk, I know how to call for a ride? So self-advocacy can be more than just um, advocating for uh, being able to get the yearbook or being able to take the shop class they really want to take. It's advocating for the skills they need to have in the future to meet their post-secondary goals. Some transition activities that we might incorporate into the IEP are instruction that teaches academics, instruction that teaches work-related skills, community skills, and those self-determination skills. Related services could be transportation to and from a job site, occupational therapy, and we so often think of occupational therapy as being to improve writing or typing at school, or perhaps to improve daily living skills such as tying shoes or fastening fasteners at school, but know that your occupational therapist could also be asked to go out on the job site with a student who has started a job site to see what modifications or accommodations may need to be made to help that student be successful in completing the task on the job site. The same with physical therapy, thinking beyond the school walls in is your physical therapist helping a student learn to navigate curbs outside of the school building and talking with that team member to brainstorm ideas of what can be done to help if your student isn't able to stand for as long as a typical worker in that position would stand. What else can we do to, to build strength or what else can we do to accommodate that student on a job site? Our PTs and OTs are an, an underused um, fount of wisdom and ideas. So let's utilize them in, uh, in helping with services related to transi transition. Another related service is having a job coach to help them as they're um, working outside of the school building. Some community experiences to consider um, are work-based, learning opportunities within the community, daily living opportunities. I know that many of you um, have incorporated <laughs> some shopping lists or shopping trips. Have you incorporated going to a um, local diner or a fast food to actually utilize a picture menu um, to order for themselves? Some of our students uh, with communication disabilities have not always ordered on their own. If you have a student who's using um, a Dynavox, have you practiced that outside of the school building before um, they exit your school system? Community experience might also be visiting a, a local college, vote, visiting the community in which that college is located to look for um, the different resources that the student needs to access when he enrolls at that college. When we're looking at transition activities related to employment and other adult living objectives, we looked at financial planning. I've been present when you've incorporated developing a budget or learning to keep a checkbook or learning to keep track of what was actually spent with their ATM cards. So keep working on those financial planning um, pieces. 
healthcare. Do your students know how to read the questions on the um, paperwork at a doctor's office and answer them accurately? Again, working on self-advocacy and self-determination. Daily living skills can include learning to drive, learning to go to the bank, learning to take care of um, themselves or take care of the kitchen, do some basic cleaning within an apartment. How can they learn to be self-sufficient? And then a functional vocational evaluation could also be a transition activity. Um, this can be a formalized employment assessment from uh, Voc Rehab or the Commission for the Blind might be part of this vocational evaluation for your students with a vision impairment. Question five, do the transition services include the course of study that will reasonably enable the student to meet his or her secondary goal? The courses need to be listed by year or grade they should be, the course of study should begin with this current year in which the IEP is written and then move forward through graduation or exit from school. Each year as the IEP is updated, that course of study should be updated to reflect that again, it's only starting with what I'm doing this year in this IEP. So what I accomplished last year does not get included in the course of study. You might incorporate some information about that within the present level of performance. Johnny wanted to enroll in carpentry um, at Northeast Community College, but after taking freshman um, wood class, he decided that he's no longer interested in that. Okay, that's a good piece showing that during freshman year, my course of study included woods class what did I learn within that that helped um, make me change my goal or change what I thought about my post-secondary goal that can be incorporated into the present level of performance but is no longer listed on the course of study. Ooh. If you have a life oh, student whom um, is in a 321 program and you don't really have course names, you can include descriptions of the skills that they are practicing on the job site or in your new course that you've um, designed for them in those th through 21. And I have a couple of, of examples of that as we move through. Okay, so the course description, the course of study should be a multi-year description of the coursework to achieve the student's desired post-secondary post-school goals from this current year through the anticipated exit year. Another thing to look for is if the student says, plan to be, go into auto body, but nothing in that course of study relates to a shop class, that would be a red flag for NDE because where in the next three years is the student going to experience what is involved um, in being a mechanic or working in auto body. Do they have a shop class or do they have a job site where they've been out to experience some of those things? If a student plans to be a nurse, what are the science courses that are included in that course of study? So the course of study must align with post-secondary goals, review it annually to ensure sure that courses were passed, that the student did not drop a course. So don't just cut and paste without actually reading it and reviewing it the next year. Um, or to note if a student was not given access to the course because your schedule changed and you couldn't fit it in in the year that you planned to. So let's make adjustments. Let's talk about it as a team. Is the counselor involved in this process? Does she already have a course plan as students enroll often in freshman um, courses in your high schools? 
the counselor has sat down with them and said, here's your course plan for the next four years. Whoa, does that match the post-secondary goal? If so, do we, does the counselor need to make some adjustments? Or at least for this first IEP, does the counselor already have it drawn out? So you're not trying to think, oh, when did they take history? Oh, when could he take his first life science class since he plans to be a marine biologist? When can he have experience to um, something related to that? Are your students in a career academy? If so, does that career academy that they're enrolled in match their post-secondary goal? What are the pieces from general education that match the post-secondary goals? And if they, and what pieces need to be provided through their special education and their um, transition activities to help them meet their post-secondary goals? Here are some examples of course of study for students who are following the extended standards, either within your district or within um, a level three program. So there are independent living skills that could be addressed like making a budget, balancing a checkbook, et cetera. Um, we may list them out in this format from 2020, in the 2020-21 school year, in reading, the student will practice reading grocery ads and words on a grocery list. In math, you will locate the price of items in a grocery ad and find the total cost for the meal using a calculator. On the job site, the student will work at one job site, greet the manager, ask what task needs to be completed and follow the directions of the job coach. Then in 21-22, we're going to change reading to reading safety signs and labels. In math, we're going to help the student calculate elapsed time so that he can determine how many hours he has worked. And on the job site, we're going to increase to three jobs this school year and focus on working well with other um, employees on the job site. The sixth question we look at when we're reviewing transition IEPs, is there at least one annual IEP goal that is related to the student's transition service needs? So we've talked about the annual goal, we've done some assessments, excuse me, we've talked about the post-secondary goal, we've done some assessments. Now within our annual goals, what needs to be incorporated to help the student work towards that post-secondary goal. Oh. <laughs> I see I have a new word. Do they offer scrolls and do they offer skills that the student will use in post-secondary situations? So do our goals incorporate um, going back to the student who needs to learn how to tell time and elapsed time, there's going to be a math goal with um, those pieces as objectives. If a student is having trouble with organizational skills and probably will not show up at a job on time because he's late for every class period, or will show up without his needed um, safety vest and hard toed shoes, steel toed shoes, because he barely remembers to be dressed appropriately for the weather on his way in the door every morning. And there are some you, you guys can all picture the student who's doing these things. We need to incorporate a, an annual goal for organization or for um, arriving at a job site with appropriate hygiene um, and uh, manner of dress. There may be a transition goal related to, an annual goal related to communication where he's learning to ask questions when he doesn't understand something or learning to use um, the Dynavox to ask questions at the job site or to address his basic needs at the job site. So when I'm looking at the post-secondary goal and the related services that you've um, designed, is there now an annual goal, at least one, 
that relates back to that student's future plans to attend college, to learn on the job, to live independently. There needs to be at least one goal that ties back to that. You may identify the connection on page five, um, perhaps in the related services will be speech, working on communication goal number one, working on communication goal number two or annual goal number three on the IEP. So have a tie back there. If it's not there today, don't worry about it. As you're moving forward, you're going to be able to show those tie backs um, in your annual goals. Question seven, probably the easiest one. Is there evidence that the student was invited to his or her <laughs> IEP meeting? You are already collecting this data. You're trying to in include them, but sometimes that large group of adults talking about me is just overwhelming. And I say, no, I am not attending the IEP meeting today. Can I just talk to you about it? beforehand or can I talk to you about it afterwards? You know, at 16, you can say yes to that. By 18, have we worked on some self-advocacy skills so that they're confident enough to at least attend a portion of the IEP meeting? And then if they get too uncomfortable for whatever reason, they can, um, they can be excused after they've advocated for what their post-secondary goal is, why they plan to live in XYZ and do ABC. So your evidence might include um, an email that you sent to the student, phone call um, to the parents, including the student's name on the IEP invitation. Um, those are all ways to incorporate that you have invited the student to the IEP. If a student chooses not to attend or parents insist that they not be at the first meeting, then you work on advocating for the student to be there for the meeting at 17, 18, or 19. Um, then just document that. I would document it um, in a notes page or even within the present level of performance that Johnny was invited to the IEP meeting um, at this time, he is not comfortable meeting with a group of adults. So we will continue to work on Johnny feeling comfortable working with a group of um, two or three adults this year in um, as preparation for next year's IEP meeting. Here's some other examples of uh, ways to provide evidence that the student was invited. Make sure that the student has his own IEP notice rather than just including him on the one that goes to mom and dad. And he can ask questions about oh, why are there six people invited to this meeting or why is um, the superintendent going to be there? Oh, that's because there needs to be a representative from the school district because the school district pays for the services when the OT and the PT come. The superintendent is the one who's going to pay for um, the job coach to go with you to green line to stock shelves or to sweep the shop. So won't it be cool when he can hear from you why you need that practice, what your goal is after you graduate. You could also include the date of the invitation and the method that you use to invite the student um, on the transition page. If the student is actually there, make sure that they've signed the IEP. Um, write comments and thoughts into the IEP during the meeting. Uh, student shared that they're now interested in attending a four-year college. And so we're um, adjusting the post-secondary goal. Um, during the meeting, Johnny shared that in science class, um, it's really hard to see the notes from where he's sitting in the 
classroom. And so the science teacher agreed to allow him to move towards the front or to change um, out of the assigned seat to meet his needs to be able to see things clearly in science class. So those are great ways to show that the student was involved in the IEP. Um, how do we prove that the, we invited agencies? Uh, much the same way. You've got the documentation on the IEP invitation. You know that they need, you have, need to have parent permission before you invite the agency representative to the meeting. And then if they did not, uh, then if they did not attend, you're keeping that invitation and or the email that you sent inviting the transition agency representative to the meeting as part of your documentation. And that leads into question eight. Um, how do you provide evidence that a representative of a participating agency was invited and the parent gave consent? I'll use that um, form that's on SRS that has the signed consent from the parents to invite a person from the outside agency to the meeting. Document phone calls, save emails, incorporate those into the student's special education file. If you have a paper file, keeping it there is great. If you plan to um, send SRS files electronically to NDE for monitoring, then it would be a good idea to upload a copy of that invitation or those emails um, to a notes page and attach it to the IEP on SRS. Again, parent consent first, and sometimes you have parents who say they do not wish to have voc rehab involved for whatever reason. If so, please keep documentation that you explained the benefits of voc rehab to the parents. And on March 19th, 2021, mom said, we are not interested in voc rehab at this time and include that in the student's file so that at age 21, the student doesn't, the parent doesn't come back and say, I had no idea voc rehab could help him to access some things in college. You never told me about that. Well, yes, I did in 2021, we talked about this and, and I made a note when we talked about it, either separate from the IEP meeting or at the IEP meeting and you weren't interested in at that time. If the agency does not attend the IEP meeting, the school needs to take other steps to ensure that the agency is aware of the student's needs, is aware of anything that, any transition activity that you assigned to that agency. You have that documentation that you, uh, the voc rehab representative couldn't be at the meeting but ask you to provide follow-up and so you followed up by saying, hey, here's a copy of the transition page, page five. Here's a copy of the page stating that his new post-secondary goal is this. And we thought it would be most helpful if Voc Rehab would do this activity to help him get to that post-secondary goal. Please let me know when you've scheduled this or if there's any other information that you need and then keep a copy of that so that if it doesn't happen within the year, you have evidence. Don't wait until the week before the annual IEP to go, oh, you know what? Voc Rehab never did that. When you're doing your quarterly progress reports, check in with um, your evidence of what's happened with Voc Rehab or developmental disabilities, those other outside agencies. Although you don't have a progress report attached to those activities on page five of the transition IEPs, you need to be checking on that progress. You need to be providing some um, updates to parents 
you know, we said that he would be on a job site during first semester, but due to COVID, he wasn't able to go to the assisted living and um, help with cooking. So we've set something up for second semester. <coughs> or we've uh, provided some opportunities to practice those skills within the school environment. So give, although it's not a requirement to give those progress reports. If in your practice, you get used to checking that transition activity section during your progress report time, uh, putting a reminder on your calendar, that will ensure that we've accomplished all of those things within the year of the IEP. Um, the other resource um, that's included within this is from IRIS. IRIS is um, a national organization connected to transition, secondary transition. So I will send that link to you in a follow-up email. I did not send it out with copies of the um, checklist today. So. All right, you've been very quietly listening to me talk. Are there any questions for the good of the group? I have a question. Sure, Cammie. Um, I have a student who has a goal to go to college and I don't remember, become a marine, no, not a marine biologist, uh, work with animals in the UK. And parents decided that this student wasn't, isn't prepared to live independently. And so um, we are going to go through with the through 21 program or the 12 plus program. And so how do I manage this goal since it's still her goal? It's still but, her, yep. But her plans have been changed for her. So how do I address that? Okay. So um, I will reassure you that NDE will not ever check to see if she actually worked in the UK. Um, but what they would be looking for is, if she wants to work with animals somewhere, have you helped her explore some job opportunities within Northeast Nebraska for working with animals? So I don't have to change the goal. I, I mean, it's still her goal. It's it just is still the, her goal, yes. And then <laughs> when you're writing resi um, results of the transition assessments or in the present level of performance or the parent concerns, you're capturing parent concerns that um, she needs to work on more independent living skills. Mom and dad's future plans include living at home and working within 20 miles of home or 30 miles of home or eventually moving to an assisted apartment but they'd like that to be within whatever mileage area and so you're working with developing some more independent living skills for her but you don't have to teach her how to get a plane ticket to go to the UK or a passport. But I'm intrigued um, I would be wanting to know from the student why she's so interested in the United Kingdom. Does that, does Great Britain tie back to television programs that she's watching? Does she have a relative that lives over there that shares some information? Or um, has she thought about staying within the United States? So capturing that within your assessment information. I personally would say it has to do with probably a television program, but it, you know, it's, I had it in my head. Um, a rescue, like an animal rescue. Animal rescue. Oh, okay. So maybe um, in this part of the state, uh, doing, looking at how we rescue animals at the animal shelter in Norfolk. 
or is that something that our local game wardens do? Um, talking about how they help with injured animals, if she really cares about animals, or even talking with a local veterinarian about how she might be able to help take care of injured or orphaned animals um, in this area. So lots of possibilities. Uh, thank you. Yep. Deb? Um, Deb, do you, Deb, do you have a question or did you just move in front of your camera which made your name light up? Oh, me? Yeah. Oh, sorry, no question. <laughs> All right. I have a question. Um, in the um, the daily living thing you had talked about, like learning to drive, um, if we put that in the IEP, does that mean that the school is responsible for that? Or would we put like parents will assist with that? But that's just something, okay. Yeah, you can put so parents will assist with that. What you might be doing as the resource teacher is helping him with some practice tests online, learning to learning the rules of the road um, and giving him some access to practice tests online for the written portion, but you wouldn't be okay. responsible for the driver's ed portion. Okay, sounds good. Have any of you experienced having a student go to the um, closed track in Lincoln or Kearney to do safety evaluation of their driving skills? It's been a few years since we've sent anyone down there. So I wondered if that was still a possibility. I think it's through, the one in Lincoln is through Madonna. Um, possibilities, okay. So for those of you who are on here because you had the privilege of being through NDE's monitoring in 2020, um, I will be reaching out to you to schedule a follow-up in uh, sometime in March so that we can do a, a review of your current IEPs for students 16 and older and see what else needs to be updated so that you can accomplish new IEP meetings for those students before the end of May. For those of you who did not have that privilege, but maybe anticipating, oh, I've got some big changes before NDE would pull our name out of the hat. Um, I would offer to uh, do a little mini file re review with you in May so that you can get things in place for um, the fall. So if, if you want that, just send me an email and say, hey, stop in and look through a couple of uh, files with me or all of my 16 to 21 files with me so that I can better prepare, um, choose appropriate transition assessments, et cetera, before we get back to school next fall. So that gives you the summer to get familiar with those assessments also. There is also, um, if it's been a long time since the transition assessment training that was offered last year through the Regional Transition Program and Amy Slama, um, send me an email and I'll send the link to her latest trainings. Um, she's done all of them as recorded webinars and Padlets in a Padlet, um, which is a new way of just organizing videos and materials um, so that you can you could have access to that and work it into your schedule this spring or summer to have an update on training and assessment. She's also working on doing a series on writing the transition IEPs, but that which many of you who are on here today participated last February, right before the world changed in Norfolk at Northeast Community College. So you may have put that binder and those ideas on a shelf and went into survival mode. So we're getting closer to being out of just survival mode now. And when Amy puts um, that training into uh, a webinar series, I'll share that out with everyone. So. Thank you for your time on a Friday afternoon. I hope that you enjoy some sunshine this weekend and please 
um, reach out with an email or a phone call if something wasn't clear today, or you just need another set of eyes looking um, at the paperwork or even a situation with a student. I'll gladly give you some support.